In this conversation, research, research experts and startup founders from the University of Toronto from sustainability fields will join together to discuss what business innovation means to them. They'll dive into topics on what we can do to adopt new technologies and how to commercialize institutional research, just to name a few. Here to introduce our panel is the Chief Operating Officer at the University of Toronto, Ron Saporta. Ron has extensive experience in leadership of redevelopment and support services, mainly focusing on the hospital and higher education environments for over 20 years. As a professional engineer, he has spearheaded the development of sustainability programs while also receiving accolade, acclamations from the Recycling Council of Ontario, the Natural Resources of Canada for Energy Efficiency, and the British Medical Journal. Please join me in welcoming Ron Saporta. Good morning, and thank you very much for that. I thought I'd start off by just giving a bit of context uh, into the University of Toronto uh, and, and what we do with respect to sustainability. I'll start off by saying that the university is uh, the third largest public sector emitter uh, of carbon. Not something that we're proud of, but something that we understand as a challenge uh, that we need to face. And as part of that, uh, we've made the commitment to take our largest campus, the St. George campus, which happens to be one of the largest in North America, and make that a climate positive. So what does climate positive mean? Well, to us, climate positive starts by taking a look at all of the emissions that we have, primarily in the scope one and scope two areas, and start to figure out how do we, how do we address those emissions in a way that doesn't just get us to net zero, but that goes beyond that x-axis, gets us into a negative carbon situation. Uh, but I'm a bit of an optimist, so I prefer to call it carbon positive. Uh, sorry, climate positive instead of carbon negative. And we start to then position our campus as, instead of a source of carbon, how can we make our, our campus uh, a, a sink of carbon? And that's what our plan is and our commitment to do that in the coming years. A couple of highlights from that, we've made a commitment to uh, eliminate the use of fossil fuels uh, for as a heating source. Um, we've done, uh, we're going to be looking at how we expand a use of renewable energies across all of our, our properties. We've also ensured that every single one of our buildings has a carbon energy, a carbon and energy budget, so we can start to really drive that down. But most importantly, what makes our type of plans different than what you see in other spaces is our ability uh, to interact and connect and really foster innovations with our academic communities. So that's partnerships with, with academics, with researchers, as well as students, and really bringing to life some innovative and phenomenal solutions. We do that in several different ways, and primarily, uh, we have 11 accelerators as part of our innovation engine that exists right across uh, all of our campuses. We, we have about 400 entrepreneurial teams every year that partake within these incubator programs. And what's really phenomenal is that over the last decade, about 20% of them have been specifically in the clean tech type industries. And through those startups, we've seen uh, them raise just shy of $300 million in startup funds. So innovation is very much ingrained in what we do and ingrained in our, in our plans moving forward. I want to turn it over to uh, Professor David Sinton, who's going to talk to three of these phenomenal examples of how we implement innovation in addressing our climate challenge. Great. Thanks, Ron. And we do have three great examples uh, of entrepreneurship to come out of the University of Toronto, and we want to dig in with them to think about what are some of the, what are some of the opportunities and the challenges for small companies right now. Um, the session earlier this morning uh, made it clear uh, not just the climate challenge, which, is, which, which has been growing over, the, over many years, but also the urgency, the newfound urgency. I think 2030 reminds us that we need to think in terms of the next few years. Uh, net zero uh, 2050 uh, also is, uh, for those of us, like those on the panel who understand the energy system, know that that's the day after tomorrow. So there's a sense of urgency there. So I want to talk about your company, and I want to, I want to understand how you have uh, massive expansion plans and how you're gonna bring those about. So we'll work our way uh, across and we'll start with Nuha Siddiqui. Nuha, your, your company, Earthos, can you tell us about, in 60 seconds or maybe 90 seconds, can you tell us about you and your company, what you're doing? 
Sure, I'm Nuha. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Earthos, and we create plant-powered alternatives for traditional plastic inputs. Um, so we focus on creating materials that are used for single-use plastics like cutlery, packaging, casing, but doing it in a sustainable way and doing it in a compatible way. Um, our goal is to really look at the industry from top to bottom and find a way to evolve what's already there. Uh, and that's why we embed sustainability from the very beginning, which is that root cause of the challenge with plastics, um, which is the raw inputs, and create an alternative for those materials. Uh, I started the company while I was still a student at the University of Toronto. I was studying business and environmental economics. Um, and since graduating in 2018, we've scaled the company. We're a team of 20 now. Um, we've raised about $7 million and we're getting ready to launch our first product to market next year. So it's an exciting year. It sounds great. And, and um, you, were, you came to the, to the tech from first a business perspective and then, and then you built your team. You knew you wanted to start a tech company. You were starting a tech company and you built your team in that perspective. And, and Olu came from a different perspective. He was sort of engineering first and now he's a business person. Um, you know, just before we move on, can you just walk us really quickly from the cornfield to a product? I know there's many different ways that you could do this, but can you give us oh, the, one ex the one vector that you're focused on? What's the waste that starts and what's the product? Yeah, typically we take agricultural byproducts, so anything that's in excess in farming and agriculture, not a food source, it's usually the byproduct, and we convert it into a plastic-like material, but entirely compostable. Great, great. Okay, we'll be back to Nuha. Olugenga, Olubenjo, nice to meet you. I call you Olu, I have permission to do so. Um, great that you could be here. Can you tell us about Ready? It's a pretty interesting company. Go ahead. Yeah, um, Dave, thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Olu, Olubenga Olubenjo. You can call me Olu for short. That's more easy. Um, so, yeah, I'm the CEO and founder of Ready. And what we do at Ready is we accelerate um, access to clean technologies in the energy regions of the world. Um, we build systems that accelerate that um, clean energy transition. Uh, specifically, um, globally, there's a lot of people apparently without access to electricity. So in Africa alone, we have 600 million people, and globally, we have over a billion people. So what we do at Ready is to build um, technologies that actually accelerate this access um, and accelerate it both um, sustainably and affordably. Um, so we have this proprietary system that we built, and we're churning out other um, software innovation to, uh, to, um, to accelerate that um, clean energy transition. Great, and, and your tech looks to me like a solution to, to power transmission, in a sense, yeah. right? In, in, in places where that's not already existing infrastructure. Um, so, so the system looks like a, a, a battery pack that's almost um, super user-friendly, compact, almost looks like iPhone styling. Like it's very, <laughs> very attractive. And, and, and the idea is people can charge that at a central location yeah. and then take that and, and, and power it. For the customers that you talk to, what's sort of the top three things they want to power? So the, f the top reason they power is they power their, most, most everybody power their phone. Like phone is like very critical. Phone's number one. Um, TVs and light. Um, those are the core critical ones, but there are also like, a lot of other systems that are power. And what we do already, I mean, I think the uniqueness of what we do beside the technology is the fact that we have to innovate on in two phases. So innovating on both the technology and innovating on the business model side. So the technology, obviously, we have to build a small park system. Like, it's easy for them to use, easy to move around, given the obviously complexity in those, system, in those um, environments. But on the, on, the, on the business model side, it's the affordability. I mean, most people in these regions of the world, um, are, they, they don't have the very high spending power. So what that means is that they, can, they could just like pull out 300 bucks or 400 bucks, just buy a system right away. Right. So we have to, we have to um, introduce this hardware as a service model, where we own the hardware, but we just rent we, we just rent the system to you for a day. So what that means is that with just 50 cents, you can have access to clean electricity for, for 24 hours. Very cool. And, and I want to come back to that. You, you, the magic word you, you gave there was hardware. I want to come back to the challenges of scaling a hardware company, which is, is shared by lots of, by all of us here on the panel. Um, Alex Zip, uh, can you tell us about your journey, CERT systems? Uh, go ahead. Sure, yeah. So uh, CERT is a carbon tech company, and basically what we're doing is we're trying to look at carbon dioxide not as a waste, but actually as a resource that we can use to build uh, the chemicals that we need to use every day. Um, and so we've developed an electrochemical technology uh, that just takes in renewable electricity, water, and carbon dioxide, and you basically split the CO2 molecule, and you, re you can reform that into the sort of things that you would normally get from fossil fuels. Um, Basically, uh, this came out of uh, some work that we did shortly after I finished my PhD at the University of Toronto. Um, we started building a research program, trying to figure out what we could use renewable electricity for in terms of um, uh, 
basically transforming carbon dioxide. And we found that we could change it in various sorts of fuels and uh, building block chemicals. Um, early on, we applied for the Carbon X Prize competition, which was basically a challenge to try and scale up uh, a carbon utilization technology as quickly as possible and demonstrate uh, that you can convert industrial uh, flue gas. Um, we did that with you know, a lot of support, a lot of tears and heartbreak along the way. Um, but we demonstrated uh, in 2020 our uh, first pilot unit converting uh, flue gas from a natural gas power plant, uh, which is really exciting. Um, and so now we're working on you know, getting bigger because as big as that was from the, the research lab, uh, we still got a lot of ways to go to, to make a dent in the, the whole carbon issue. But uh, we're very excited to see where we can take that. Great, and, and that's a great lead into to our next topic when we think about scale. I think there's a, there's a, a growing realization of, of the importance of small companies, bright folks leading new approaches that, that, that break away from the, from the incumbents. Um, so, so that we, we know is true and you guys are all proof of that. How do we take that energy, those good ideas, new ways of doing things, and, and then reach scale? Uh, in, in, in software companies, you know, they, have, they have easier routes to scale. Not easy, but easier, right? They can make a website and advertise it. Good. Companies that, that have power distribution, that, have, that are making plastics, that are, that are making products and fuels, um, that's harder, right? It's also, when I look at the SDG uh, 17 goals, to me, they look like hardware goals. I think the challenge is hardware-ish, isn't it? Or infrastructure, stuff. Stuff we use every day. That's where our climate challenge came from. So that's where the solution lies. Doesn't make it easy. Nuha, what's your approach to scale? What are your partnership? What's your plans to get to, on a 2030 time scale, major global impact? I think it really comes down to collaboration and being open-minded. I think the worst thing that we can do as entrepreneurs is build incredible tech and have it limit to a certain region or a certain market. Um, and so we learned this very early on in our journey that Yes, we wanted to try to create sustainable materials for plastics and packaging, but we didn't need to do it alone. We needed to find a way to utilize or leverage existing infrastructure, which has ta taken decades to build. Um, and as soon as we kind of shifted our mindset and realized that people want sustainable technologies to scale, there's no reason why they wouldn't. There's no reason why we can't just approach them and start collaborating. Um, and so, we are research focused and we've been research focused, but we've also been industry focused from the very beginning. And we've made sure that we've had really great industry partners come into the development phase when we're building our materials so that we can make sure that the tech that we're building can be adopted at the very end of our supply chain. Um, and I think that's really what sets us apart and creates a diverse skill set with our team as well. So is that, that, that group of partners you mentioned, is that um, existing packaging companies that could, that could, that could partner with you and, and, and build in your sustainable tech and, and therefore charge a, a green premium for that and grow their business, is that? Exactly, so it's a combination of existing manufacturers, brands and CPGs, everyone who's currently right. looking for sustainable materials. Um, it always starts with the material. And so we're trying to make sure we're seamlessly integrating into this supply chain of, of use cases. Right, and, and Nuha, that's a great, that's a great point that, it's, that the, the supply chain is the obvious receptor, but it's often, uh, and, and could be in this case, consumer driven, right? Exactly. From, the, from the far end, which, yeah. is, which is the branding piece. Very cool. Olu, uh, talk to us about your hardware challenge, your scaling plans, uh, partnerships or building up. What, what's, what's your next beachhead in that area? Yeah, um, like Nuha said, um, there's always been a lot of like collaboration and obviously it's very important as a small startup to like scale up of what you're doing. So we have also been doing a lot of collaboration, but funny collaboration. I mean, we, are, we got to this stage actually we're collaborating deeply with you of T. Like I remember I was, um, um, during my time at UFT, I spent all the time in the like um, 3D labs, just trying to like print 3D stuff, print 3D um, systems, and that made it very. But you cheap did. You did spend some time on your problem sets, though, yeah. right? I mean, after doing problem sets, just then you go back to 3D printing. Yeah, 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 yeah 3D okay. prints. And uh, I mean, we did it for free then when I was in UFT as a student. And cool. I mean, those kind of collaboration made us take off the technology. And even in the market, as we are in the market now, we are doing a lot of collaboration with distribution partners. We are talking to a lot of people, um, collaborating with on the financial side and also on the infrastructure side. I think. Be, but beside collaboration, it's also the what you mentioned around like customer. So what we do was also like what incent, how do you incentivize customers to shift to this new sustainable behavior? 
Because, I mean, no matter how you try to chase sustainability, if it's not economical for customers or like for your business partners, they don't, they are not going to shift. So, and that's why we are like, for us, we, we, are, we are probably the, one of the cheapest um, system that exists now. So people see instead of buying, going to buy petrol, then fueling their generator, it just makes sense for them to just rent the capsules and go. So what we are, the challenge we have now even in, this, in Nigeria is that there's more demand and supply that we can make. So it's, it's obviously led to a lot of like we building or like other, um, as other vertical innovation to scale the system. And like Noah said again, oh, there are some already developed pipelines that one can scale some innovation on. Like for us now, one of the things we are thinking about is leveraging on existing gas stations. So these gas stations have infrastructures and people, they have food traffic. We can just roll our, our, our capsules um, locations across those gas stations right. and things can scale all, all, all through Nigeria. So We've, we've been having this, this conversation with leading gas companies, both locally, internationally, and um, there's also a lot of like bigger plans. And the beauty of it is that the more the the, we, the more the data we get, the more we have some kind of modes that allows us to, like um, capture a lot of opportunities that come to the market. Right. So it's, um, it's just it's been a very very interesting ride. I must be frank. Very cool. And sounds like you've got some distribution channel partnerships uh, brewing and and roots and. Uh, and, and like uh, Nuha, you've got people that, that want the product, yeah. period, right? So that, that, sure. that will, uh, I suspect capital will come, yeah. uh, is already coming, I guess. Uh, Alex, your route to scale, how do, you, how do you make this thing huge? You've got uh, nine years. Yeah, so not, not a whole lot of time, but um, I think like uh, both these guys have been saying, a really important part of this is collaboration, find the partners and the customers that, uh, you know, are looking for solutions, um, are looking for, uh, this they see, yeah, by 2030, we better have something, right? Um, and so doing that early on, having the collaboration, when you're still like at U of T in a research lab uh, and talking with, you know, the big industry partners that, that uh, need those solutions, I think that's been really key in helping us shape uh, the way that we develop our technology. Um, you don't want to, you know, be working in a lab um, and then emerge five years down the line with a solution that nobody wants, right? And so starting those conversations, getting really involved very early, I think has been really key. Um, and then the challenges uh, in, talking, in talking with those partners as well is like, there's not just gonna be one partner that you need to collaborate with. There's the whole value chain, whole supply chain that you need to, uh, you need to interact with, need to understand how it works. Um, you don't need to do that all on your own. You should be, you should be having lots of those conversations, but, um, Shaping the the path to scale, I think, is something that um, really needs a lot of a lot of interaction with everybody all along that chain, down from like you know, who's taking out fossil fuels now and transforming, and who's going to be using the end product at the end, and everybody in between. I think it's really important that right. um, we get everybody engaged in developing these solutions. Yeah, and, and my sense is from all those um, big companies, they're they're engaged and looking for great solutions, right? So they're cheering, they're cheering you folks, and and like many, you know, maybe. It, a year ago, a company could, a big company could stand out by making a net zero pledge, uh, but now a company stands out if they haven't made a net zero pledge. So, so everybody's on the timeline. Your, your biggest partners and potential um, uh, investors are on the timeline. So, th so that's that's uh, exciting. And then, and like Nuha, you've got you've got the pathway, and I get it from 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 field to to, to plastic product. In, in, in Alex's case, it's from CO2 source, be it air or flue gas, uh, through, to, through to product. Right? And, you, and you've got partnerships and supply chain and challenges, excited participants all the way up and down that line, but it's, but it's gonna be a, a challenge and I think you're well, well set up to do so. Um, I wanna come to, to support. So, so um, you know, what, what helped you get to where you are? And I think some of you touched on, on, on a few of them. Uh, but what were key supports that, that, that took you from a, from a student uh, to, to an entrepreneur and, and successful one? And, and then maybe also, are there other things that we could do better? We, the university, but also there's a broad audience. We, the government, we, industry. Uh, so a big question, but supports. It's a loaded question for sure. Um, I'd say in terms of, of supporter, what I really uh, took advantage of to be here today is really around the, the community that I had at U of T. Um, I was lucky enough to be exposed to interdisciplinary collaboration, which, you know, coming from a business and environmental economics background, I would have never imagined I'd be building a material science company. But I think that's, that's the beauty of universities is that you're exposed to really smart people in different disciplines, and it's really important to, to take advantage of that. 
Um, other than other than that, though, there's you know a lot of accelerators that I was part of, like Next and CDL, which were all at UT, CDL, great, um, which were fundamental in our journey as well. Um, from an industry perspective, I'd say that it's really time to start creating new benchmarks. We're all creating a new market for sustainability, and that can only happen if we all shift our expectations of technology. And that that can be as simple as you know, I'm, I'm receiving this single-use plastic product. It may not be as durable enough to last 10 years, but that's okay because it doesn't need to be. Right. Um, and so I think there's still that shift that needs to happen as an industry um, or just as general consumers where we need to start accepting and building new benchmarks. That's great. I'm glad you mentioned that. So, so as our, our audience members, what, what can they do? They can look for brands that, that, that advertise. Uh, can you give us some examples of of how they can they can in their consumer choices steer change. Yeah, I think it's all it comes down to awareness, learning more about the materials that surround you every day. Right. You'd be surprised at how much plastic is around you and how you can identify various ways to to take care of that. And um, it's important to understand that numbers matter. There's there's a lot of companies out there that are being transparent about metrics. Um, just because something is eco-friendly doesn't mean it's sustainable. Right. And so we need to start asking those questions. To dig a little bit, and maybe that's an opportunity um, yeah, for, for almost a governing body there, right? To, to look at, to look at uh, consumer products and do that deep audit. I think there's, there's active work on that. Olu, how about you? Supports that, 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 that made you who you are today, and, and if there's more that we could do. Yeah, I think luckily I've got a lot of support. I mean, from UFT. Some, some, I, I remember a friend of mine called me UFT baby. I was like, yeah. I mean, I've always been getting lost stuff from UFT. Um, so for me, I, I started with civil. I was, I did my master's in civil engineering at the university at the University of Toronto. So no, obvious no experience in energy at all. Um, but luckily, I met uh, one of I met a mechanical engineer, a student, a electrical engineer. They had one that developed our first prototype, right. and they did it very well. And um, so it's just it's back to nice. Also that collab that community. Um, but besides that, it's also the fact that I was a research student, so I have a very, very amazing professor who was very, very hard on like way learning. So like the, I think one of the critical skills that you can you can equip yourself with as is, as um, as anybody is learning how to learn. So I've being able to know where to find solutions right. and being able to apply to apply those solutions. So I have a professor, Professor Shinasa, she was extremely amazing. Um, I was a research student and she was always like pushing to like go go learn, like think throughout, think out, out of the box and try to like crack some of these hmm. tough, obviously, um, research solutions. So those those skills, even though then I was like, oh my God, these are a lot, but like, Working on my own business now, I see how, 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 how I, I apply a lot of those skills. So, like learning how to learn, learning how to where to look for solutions, being very confident in approaching people, approaching partners, and just saying, okay, I need this, I'm going to go get it. This is how I need to get it. This is where I need to check. This is where I need to do. These are how I need to like research the solutions. I also very very critical. Um, skill anybody can equip themselves with, and beside that also is also the community, um, ne um, the community of like accelerators. So for me, I was part of Atri, I was part of Impact Center, mm. I was part of U Test. All those communities are very very essential when it comes to like they bring some solid support that makes things like um, they, they make the whole process easy for you as an entrepreneur. Cool. So it, not just from mentorship to like getting individuals um, to collaborate to getting advisors. It's just that web of systems actually make the whole piece come together. Sounds good, and and I want to ask you if, if you uh, if you were in an engineering class and, and and somebody said, hey, if you want to, you can lead an electrical distribution company across uh, Africa. Um, anyway, but we'll we'll talk offline. <laughs> Alex, the supports that made you who you are, who, who helped your company, and what we could do better. Yeah, I think starting from like day one doing the research, I think really um, the support of the professors first of all, and then also. Um, being open to then connecting with industry partners and bringing that into the research, like I said, that was really helpful in helping to shape, you know, what the technology became, something that you know uh, people would actually want. Um, but I, I'm thinking a lot about, you know, the the Carbon X Prize competition that that we took part in. Um, you know, when you're working at a bench in like a tiny Rubik's cube sized cell. Uh, trying to imagine deploying something that's taking flue gas from a natural gas power plant is a little bit ridiculous, um, and so that needs a lot of a lot of support. And um, thankfully, U of T had a lot of that. That maybe is a bit opaque to you when you're when you're a student there, um, but all the like the legal and permitting and all that sort of support to help you like um, 
think of all the things that you weren't wouldn't be thinking of, you know, from engineering background necessarily. Right. Uh, what it takes to actually get something uh, onto a site. I think that was really really helpful, and definitely the the support of facilities at U of T. Kind of, um, you know, talking about the climate positive um, impact. I think. Uh, they supported us early on in the XPRIZE to, you know, help us get out to site and uh, they're looking at, you know, integrating our technology as well onto, onto campus and really sh um, kind of giving us like a, a first place to demonstrate. I think that, that sort of support is really, really important. Um, those kind of first of a kind, first, first demonstrations um, because they're, they're hard to get, right? Um, but they're a lot easier to get once somebody has kind of, you know, taken a chance on you, taken a chance to show what your technology can do. Um, and I think like that sort of uh, support is really, really critical um, in a place where, you know, academia can really help uh, with these early stage technologies. With those first and the, and the benefits of a deadline, right? The XPRIZE uh, enabled you to really rise to that challenge. And, and the 2030 deadline and the 2050 deadlines enable uh, hopefully all of us to, to have great success on this panel. So thanks so much, you guys. This has been great.